Once again, welcome to Paltop Academy. This is Science Lifting Techniques from A to Diva, Part 2 of 4, Planning, Prevention, and Complications. And again, I am Alejandro Berg, oral surgeon from Universidad de Chile, and a 25-year implant specialist. So, let's get on with it. These are my emails and uh, WhatsApp number, phone number. If you ever need to contact me, I'm always willing to help and always willing to talk. So please do. In order to be successful and predictable while performing sinus lifts, we need to correctly evaluate our patient. And evaluation means medical history, uh, clinical time, um, maybe internal scanners or models or a combination of all, but most definitely means x-rays. And so let's talk about those. And when I say x-ray, the first thing that comes to mind to 99% of the colleagues is periapical x-rays. And even though there are compensation techniques and uh, paralleling techniques, actually this type of x-ray does not work. It's not suited for this type of evaluation. It's true that you can find some things, but in terms of height or width or membrane lining, actually no. So let's discard them. Second choice would be panoramic x-rays, which is basically requested by two of out of three dentists as the method for sinus lift elevation assessment. This technique is riddled with false positives, false negatives. So as a first approach, maybe, but it should be definitely, definitely complemented with 3D imaging. And by 3D imaging, I mean large window CVCT or an equivalent to that. So your first approach might be an X-ray, a panoramic X-ray. And yes, you might find something or you might not find something. And you could find a lesion or a fistula or a root. Yes, but anything you want to do in terms of sinus lift elevation, and I know I'm repeating myself, must be done with 3D imaging. And studies show that only one in three colleagues ask for a CBCT prior executing um, sinus lifts. And that is a potential problem. One should always remember that a panoramic X-ray is basically a flat image of a curved arch following a determined pattern of projection. And if your lesion is outside the pattern of projection, you might miss it. But on a CVCT, it will be as clear as day. As early as the two year 2000, the European Association for Force Integration presented guidelines uh, for the use of 3D imaging and implant cases and sinus lift cases in order to use the uh, information presented by us with great precision by CVCT, which goes within 0.5 millimeters, which is actually quite good, and or MRIs, if you don't want to go into ionizing radiations. Also, now we know that we can 
seamlessly include CVCTs inside our office because now they are part of the digital flow, which is, well, all the rage. So you went all out and bought yourself a brand new, beautiful CVCT machine, placed it in your office, and went through the process of learning how to use it. And so what? What do we do with it? Well, we do many things, but one of those is pre-surgical evaluation. And that means we find stuff. We evaluate for septa and the nasolacrimal duct and the osteomethyl complex and its function and memory thickness and the presence of cysts or pseudocysts or uh, orontal fistulas. Well, you, you get the idea. We find pretty much everything. And why? Why do we do this? Because we want to control our access. In pre-surgical management, we want to design our surgery to avoid primary and secondary complications. So a CVCT machine will make your life easier. Another thing, and this is the one thing where CVCT has no real comparison, is the pre-surgical blood vessel evaluation. You can identify and localize blood vessels that will potentially cause primary and secondary um, complications. And you can design your access and your surgery to avoid these complications. This is actually great. So let's summarize. CBCT works great for pre-surgical evaluation. Identify, localize, and find stuff. That helps you design your way in and avoid primary and secondary complications. That is all well and good. But there is another use for CBCT, which is post-op control. And post-op control lets you find out about any abnormal situation or problem that could come from your surgery. So you get your initial CVCT and you know what your surgery should look like and you take a post-op CVCT and compare. And with that, you can take a look, decide what to do if there's a problem and fix it as soon as possible in order to have as minimum repercussions for your patient and for yourself. And we have finally arrived. Sinus lift techniques. After all these grueling hours of remembering the basics, finally. So, the first successful, repeatable, predictable Schneider membrane elevation and sinus lift technique was presented by Tatum. 76, 77, and he used bone taken from the iliac crust, crushed, and through an opening of a lateral window performed by high-speed burrs, and then separation of the Schneider membrane with periosteal elevators, a very careful one, he introduced this crushed bone and then he filled the space he created and we have presto in a couple of months a bigger crustal bone 
higher limits and you can place implants. So this was the, the late 70s. And as dentists, you know that pretty much the next day of publication, everybody was trying to either change or improve or simplify the, the techniques. And, uh, well, I was lucky enough to be taught how to perform lateral window technique by Dr. Engelke, a very prestigious German doctor that came to teach us in 97. And I found it to be the solution to all, pretty much all my problems. And I had really good success rate. And so I was happy. Until 2001, when virtuality and friends said, you know what? No more high speeds, no more low speeds. Let's do piezo surgery. So I learned that, bought myself a machine, and started doing piezo surgery. And although it was lower, it was very success. Yes, a su successful, very successful. Low perforation rate and very good. So everything was good. But I had a problem. The surgery was and is still very invasive and technique sensitive and expensive because it needs lots of materials like grafts and uh, membranes and it's time consuming and also there are so many variants in this technique like uh, this one where you get a bone block and you have all these piezo pieces to make the block fit and then you need screws and of course then you will uh, need to perform uh, soft tissue grafts and well in the end all was very very time consuming and very invasive for the patient so changes had to come. So this is a little teaser for you to come back for our next webinar. Patient, male, mid-50s, um, diabetic, former smoker, and as an extra, this patient had to undergo left eye surgical removal due to a invasive type of cancer. So he only has his right eye, which was a real concern for him prior to accepting or consenting to undergo sinus lift surgery. So a small H flap with very little um, traction. This patient will undergo two implant surgery. And so we go from uh, number six up to number three. Normally, for a single implant surgery, we just open a very small window, and since this was going to be recorded with a little larger, so we could have better imaging. Now, adjusting the stops and direct um, compression with the osteotome, this patient only has three millimeters in remnant, it is an SAC class three. 
And yes, we could have produced a guide for full guide and then ostium surgery, but actually was very straightforward and very simple. So we decided not to. And so as you see, we just apply direct pressure. Uh, very slight probing and we complete our um, initial bone disc formation and slightly displacement of it towards the sinus. Very slight probing as you can see half the way of the uh, first marking which is six millimeters and this is a diva implant 375 by 13. We could have placed an 11.5 but well this was a, a case for uh, doing this. So um, we insert the implant until we attain uh, primary stability uh, which is being now uh, we remove internal screw with the provided 1.25 millimeters um, internal hex and we take out the long screw as you can see the implant stays completely stable and this is a disposal long screw there's another one in the um, veil and so now you can see a little drop of that which means we have perforated the um, cortical bone and we are starting our displacement with liquid we use um, saline you could use metronidazole but we use saline regular saline and 1 cc and we turn this around uh, approximately uh, one millimeter so we can gain depth and as you see we do it slowly another cc we use between one and two cc's every time in a pulsating pulsating manner you can see that water or the saline comes back to the mouth uh, again another full turn another millimeter and there is good resistance again by hand not motor another CC and this is a repetitive manner we take care not to introduce bubbles or try not to introduce bubbles inside the implant to, towards the membrane so again another turn and now we have uh, inserted most of our implant we will proceed in this manner until all the implant is inside by always we always check that the saline comes back that means that the membrane is intact as long as saline comes but comes back your membrane is fine that is very very good and is very easy to observe while performing surgery again watch the saline in a pulsating manner saline comes back and that is what we expect and you can see when the patient um, breathes there the saline comes back which means we are in the sinus we have to place the membrane correctly and everything is on its way Again, I would say CC of saline. This is pretty much real time. It only takes us about 
a few minutes. See that the patient breathes in and the pressure takes the saline out. So again, analysis C, and we're finalizing our implant in about, oh, I don't know, 10 minutes for a full sinus lift. And the last one, or not the last CC, I usually use a little more than a CC or maybe two in the last one, just to ensure. As you can see, we can we keep checking the integrity of the membrane. And again, another turn. This time, we take care that the flat side of the of the hex faces vestibular. We are going to gain a little more depth. Check the implant. And again, by hand, slowly rotation and keeping a um, good check of the membrane integrity. Last you see, and now graft through the, through the implant. This is beta tricalcium phosphate inside a hyaluronic acid gel. And so we inject. We have normally 0.5 cc's, which is more than enough. Um, we have, you have to check because sometimes we receive syringes with one cc. And you could be uh, overpacking. We clean the inside of the implant with saline again. Uh, I usually try again to um, insert more bone. Um, and until the um, graft material comes back through the implant, you can see it there. This cannula is provided by the company. I check the that it is flowing and I reinsert and I go for more bone. I see that it comes back. So I am pretty much finishing. You can see the syringe. And now I clean in the inside of the implant. I remove all that I can to ensure that everything will be clean. And I take the secondary short bob screw that comes in the package. And you can see that it's much shorter than the initial one. And insertion by hand. And you see that you will see that I apply torque and the implant is fully stable. Now I use Penwin, everybody may use uh, ISQ system, but I got 70, 76, 76. So we remove the peg and we place the final, I mean, initial healing uh, cap. And since he's, he's going to get another implant on number five, but that is it. So now you see why we pretty much don't see sinus lifts. It only takes about 10 minutes and you get 375 by 13 if you want to. So let's put that idea in the back of our heads and let's do a little summary of the considerations for lateral window technique. First, membrane thickness. As we said, thicker membranes have less perforation rate as long as they are healthy. Second, the angle made by the buccal and palatal alveolus crest with the medial wall. The smaller the angle, the larger the perforation rate you will have. 
with lateral window technique. Vascularity. The preservation of the vascularity will allow you to avoid hemorrhage, either intra or post-op, but will also help and support new bone formation. Septa. The presence of septa will definitely make you manage your access and probably change the way you were intending to perform your surgery in order to avoid primary and secondary um, problems. Nasal lacrimal duct. When you're performing lateral window technique, this is somewhat important. We need not to pack material inside the nasal lacrimal duct. Infraorbital nerve. Well, let's avoid uh, causing neurological problems to our patients with our incisions. So we have to design our access correctly. And the ostium or ostiometal complex needs to be assessed and please do not overpack your graphs in order not to block the complex so as not to induce later pathology. So another consideration should be bone. And by bone, I mean remnant bone. So if you find yourself in an SAC3 class with uh, less than 1.5 uh, millimeters of crystal bone, you might not have enough trabecular bone. And studies show that regeneration may take much longer. So even though that is described for techniques up to four millimeters, I can tell you that with 2.5, you can do it. But if you have less than that, your implant placement should be in a delayed technique. Another consideration should be your lateral wall. Since most uh, lateral window techniques uh, compromise the external wall of the sinus, this should this wall should be very well assessed and especially uh, one should know the thickness because there are times where there is no bony wall and the Schneider membrane is already fused to your periosteal membrane and it will mean that you will have a perforation while you detach so that should be considered and you should be prepared for that. Prevention in sinus elevation. This is a list of do's and don'ts. So don't would be the irreversible conditions and do's well, those you can um, fix prior to attempting sinus elevation. You can read the list, but basically uh, Non-reversibles are post-traumatic post uh, scar tissue or uh, irradiated bone or the presentation of manifestations of Wagner's or any other granulomatosis uh, or sarcoidosis uh, and tumor related from aggressive tumors. On the other side, the repairable conditions that we can fix prior to surgery are basically any anatomical or structural alteration that can be fixed by an ENT surgery. Uh, the ARS or CRS that is not related to congenital problems or other alterations, and uh, if tumor related, 
should be non-obstructive and hopefully benign. We should also assess for behavioral risk factors like smoking, which is a very well-known factor for implant failure and graft failure. And then there is cocaine. Cocaine abusers usually have rhinosinusitis, but cocaine also destroys bone and damages the Schneider membrane in a very aggressive way. And that is something to be considered prior to sinus intervention. So we arrived to the ugly part, which are the complications. And this is a list of introverted complications. The most common by far is the perforation of the Schneider membrane. Then we have bleeding and perforation of the buccal plug. And minor incidents, injury to the infraorbital nerve, damage to the adjacent dentition, perforation of the medial or the orbital wall, implant displacement to the sinus, obstruction of the ostium, and damage or obstruction of the nasal lacrimal duct. So we'll go one by one and see what's what. So as we just said, the most common complication is the Schneider and membrane perforation. And in lateral window technique by rotary instrumentation, the ranges of perforation go from one in every 10 to one in every two surgeries. And very experienced clinicians report regularly one perforation in every four surgeries. If we go by membrane thickness, the perforation rate would be one in every two if your membrane is less than 1.5 millimeters thick and one in every five or one in every six if your membrane is thicker than 1.5 millimeters. Other point of view would be in the presence of septa. And studies have shown that in the presence of septa, one of every two surgeries report some kind of perforation. Another important viewpoint would be the angle made by the medial wall and the bony floor of the sinus. If your angle is lower than 30 degrees, you will have a perforation in every 62.5%, which is six out of every 10. And if your angle is 30 to 60 degrees, you will have a perforation in every three surgeries. And if the angle is larger, well, we should be safe and there are no cases reported. So if you have a perforation, let's say less than five millimeters, you can overlap uh, a resolvable membrane and finish your surgery and the resolvable membrane should have no impact in the vascularization of your graft. If you have a large 10 millimeter tear, the use of unstabilized membranes would be ill-advised. Hence, you should try stabilizing a large membrane with tacks in order to be able to perform your uh, graft. And in the presence of a very large uh, tear, you might attempt a Loma Linda pouch technique, but you will have to re-enter at a later date to place your implants. Bleeding may come from soft tissue while elevating the flap or from the lateral bony wall if you injured 
the branch that runs parallel to the um, alveolar crest. Normally, this happens when you're doing lateral window by rotor instrumentation. You may also get bleeding from the medial wall if the lateral nasal artery is damaged. The preservation of vascularity is very important since it provides blood to your graft and accelerates angiogenesis and the set of the anabolic process to form bone. Turning off the flap and uh, infraorbital nerve injury. This may come from perforation during incision, traumatic flap retraction, aggressive flap retraction, the presence of prior scar tissue or undiagnosed exostosis, the presence of a fistula or lesion that wasn't correctly assessed, or while executing sharp dissection to advance the flap for uh, closure. This, in, this is normally in relation to not only sinus list, but um, volume correction with grafts. Paresthesia of the second branch of the fifth pair could be either temporary or permanent, depending on what happened. Implant displacement to the sinus may occur uh, due to a wrong assessment of the subventral bone in terms of height, or over drilling, or uh, poor bone quality, or excessive pressure while installing the implant. Uh, also, it may happen in a delay manner due to an underprepared site that will generate pressure necrosis. But there is also the possibility that the patient is a removal prosthesis wearer and this denture may apply premature loading to the implant through the mucosa generating fibrosis and migration. So graph material moving into the sinus. That might happen because of uh, an undetected uh, Schneider membrane perforation, or if we diagnosed that and we attempted a repair and it was not successful, or um, overpacking our uh, cavity uh, that will induce uh, necrosis of the membrane, and well. In the end, I would recommend the use of a material that has viscosity, which means cohesiveness. So if there is some kind of perforation, there won't be any displacement of the graft into the sinus, and we will avoid secondary complications. This is a simplified chart that represents the decision-making process if after a maxillary sinus elevation there are symptoms and signs that will now go into resolution after three weeks. If a sufficient quantity of graph material migrates into the sinus cavity, we may have postural complications that range from expelling some bloody graft material through your nose to blockage of the osteomedial complex with stagnation and stagnation would mean the installation of ARS, CRS or the infection of the graft and with that you may get damage to the eye 
thrombosis of the carinus sinus, cerebral infection, and death. And I know this is an extreme case, and it's rarely mentioned, even less described, but it's mostly associated to lateral window technique, and it should be in your legal documents. So please do include them. And it's most likely um, due to venous drainage taking an upward course, and that would mean that bacteria from the sinus will end in the uh, cerebral vein system through the white matter, and there you go. And this is one of the reasons why we perform such complete and severe examination of our patients prior to uh, sinus elevation techniques. And a much simpler post-op complication area, we could have benign vertigo, which is usually associated to the use of mallets with osteotomes or pressure fit implants. And what happens is basically you remove or dislodge some athletes from the inner ear, uh, inducing these vertigo episodes. It usually is treated with a police procedure, which is quite successful. Another complication would be disruption of the apical blood supply to the adjacent teeth. Well, this happens because of pneumatization. And because of pneumatization, you lose cortical bone around the apex of the adjacent teeth. So that neurovascular bundle gets fused to the Schneiderian membrane. So when you produce the elevation of the membrane, you disrupt the vascularity of the neighboring teeth and you have the potential for pulp and necrosis. That would mean that those teeth will need endo treatment. Again, it's mostly associated to lateral window technique and you should stay away from the neighboring teeth about three to five millimeters just to prevent any possible complication. So excessive bleeding, and again, this is mostly associated to lateral window technique. Uh, the most common reason is the disruption of the intraosseous branch that runs through the lateral window of the maxillary sinus by using rotary instruments. A second cause would be the possible section of deep blood vessels while performing periosteal slits in order to advance our flap to attain primary closure. And a third cause could be the damage to the nasal artery that runs through the medial wall of the maxillary sinus. If bleeding is not controlled by cauterization or ligation or bone crushing, uh, we might get to a point where we have to go in again to do this, and that would mean re-entry and losing probably most of our bone graft, which is not nice if we perform grafting. And there is incomplete elevation of the Schneider membrane. We could be creating an abnormal compartment that could be filled with uh, liquid or have insufficient, insufficient drainage. And that could very easily get infected. There is another possibility that is, if we did this, we would not have enough bone to place an implant, even though it's not infected, or even if it worked perfectly, there might be not enough 
bone volume to place an implant securely. In order to avoid this, one should have the most possible visualization and direct access to manage the membrane. And so we get to uh, the last post-op complication of the list, which is facial hematomas. And even though they are flamboyant, they are, in most cases, nothing but a, let's say, minor and self-resolving situation. Your patient should be aware of the possibility, you should be aware, and nothing but standard treatment should apply, unless one of two things happen. First, a facial hematoma could get infected. And like any hematoma, which is basically a pool of blood isolated from regular vasculature, and that means your pool of blood is not susceptible to the use of antibiotics or will not respond correctly to the use of antibiotics. And you might have to go in for second surgery and drainage. And number two, in conjunction with uncontrolled bleeding, you might have obstruction of the airway and your patient uh, may lose conscience and you might end in an ICU unit under anesthesia draining this um, blockage of the airway in order to preserve the life of your patient. I would recommend that you watch Dr. Michael Ava. Um, he did a very nice webinar on treating post-op complications. I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us in this, the second part of our webinar that takes us one step closer to the use of Diva system. I am Dr. Alejandro Berg, and I hope to see you really, really soon.